Uh, what I'm hoping to convince you of today is that uh, you have resources all around you as engineers that you can draw from pretty dramatically. And those resources are stored in zoos, like the San Diego Zoos, where I am based. Also, uh, natural history museums, aquaria, as well as nature preserves that live and exist all around where you are. The world is full of inspiration from which you can draw these wonderful ideas, these wonderful innovations that you as engineers are so great at, at creating. So, about two minutes, evidently. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what, what I'm going to do with the presentation today is talk to you a little bit about the, the approach that we have. How many people at present do things that you would say are biomimicry or bioinspiration related research? Oh, all right, all right, a fair amount. Good, 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 excellent. Maybe a tenth or so of the, of the audience. So I want to introduce a little bit the idea of biomimicry and bioinspiration. Then I want to go through an example, or a series of examples um, of a couple of interesting organisms, all insects. I am an entomologist. My PhD was in entomology. I worked with beetles and ants, so that's going to be a lot of the organisms that we'll be going through. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about their structure, their morphology, their behavior, and their ecology. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about what the zoo does and why the zoo is involved in biomimicry and bioinspiration. And uh, as I understand, we also have a special visitor that will be coming towards the end that is non-human of origin. So that will be there. Almost there. All right, so um, the biomimicry and bioinspiration, I'll, I'll start off with that. That's the beginning of the talk. Biomimicry and bioinspiration are two terms that are bandied about a lot. Most folks are more familiar, I assume, with biomimicry than bioinspiration. Uh, biomimicry has a longer track record in terms of exposure to the public. Bioinspiration is much more recent. Uh, biomimicry is what people have in the past um, used for this field, but it is a little inaccurate in that what engineers do, you don't, you don't try to mimic nature. Right? You're, not, you're not trying to be like those early people that tried to create flying machines by mimicking the wings of a bat, for example, and jumping off of cliffs. Right? That doesn't work so well. <laughs> you know, it's hard to pull down against the weight of the body. Uh, and so they failed pretty dramatically. Instead, if you can think about bioinspiration being a better model... Great, that's perfect. So, as opposed to the early biomimeticians, like Leonardo da Vinci, actually, which is what this model was based on, where he would actually directly mimic an organism, the bat. Engineers are more like bioinspirationalists. We, we, you draw inspiration from nature, right? So instead of trying to mimic the form of the bat, you instead mimic the form of the airfoil of the wing of the bat or of the bird, or of the butterfly, or of the dragonflies, all of whom have an airfoil, where, which is, of course, it's, it's convex, so wind flows, air flows faster on the top than on the bottom, provides lift. Right? So really what, what you do as engineers, or what engineers who have engaged in this have done in the past, is really bioinspiration rather than biomimicry. So I'll, I'll switch back and forth between the two terms, just because this is a very recent uh, switch in our, in our direction as well. We're still called the San Diego Zoo Biomimicry Cluster, so uh, this is still a nomenclatural change that we're in the midst of as well. So a lot of my background not only is with insects, but of the evolutionary history of insects. And what I want to uh, suggest is that really the future of engineering is the past. The past in several ways, and that, that early engineers like Leonardo da Vinci drew, drew inspiration from nature and tried to build things based on that inspiration. But also in the past in the sense that the history of the world, the history of life has come about through millions of years of evolutionary trial and error. And so we, we have right now a repository of, of ideas from which we can draw the creation of products that come from... 1.2 million species of insects that have been named thus or 1.2 million species of anything that have been named thus far. There's about an order of magnitude greater than that of species that exist. Right? So about 90% of life has not been named or described. That's an amazing, maybe 12 million species that exist out on the planet. 
That's an amazing repository of inspiration for you all as engineers to draw from. And people have in the past done this very directly by pulling pharmaceuticals out of plants, biomimetic products along the lines of what we've been talking about thus far. And as I've said, I am an entomologist, so insects are everything uh, in my world. About 54% of all named species are insects. Right? Over half of anything, any organism, whether it's bacteria, protista, single-celled organisms, fungi, animals, or plants, over half of everything that has ever been named is an insect. That's amazing. What's that? What is an insect? What is an insect? An insect is anything with six legs, and at least in the history of its evolution, two pairs of wings. So here's our butterfly with one, two, three, four wings. Our plant bug over here with one, two, three, four, five, six legs. A pair of antennae, right? And actually, it gets even more remarkable. As I said, I work with beetles. Uh, a, tw- a fifth of all of life, around 21% of all named species that exist on the planet are beetles. This is an amazing repository of, of the past, right? Of the history of evolutionary success stories. Look to beetles. Look to the little things, especially. And so that's what I'm going to be drawing from for my examples as we talk about today. I want to briefly talk about uh, a few different approaches, dichotomies within the field of biomimetics or bioinspiration. Um, we can talk about product-based or bioinspiration products or system-based products that are, we can call eco-inspiration, right? So a, a product-based biomimetic product is lotus sand. How many folks have heard of Lotus Sun? Have anyone heard? All right, not that commonly known. It's a very innovative product. It's based on lotus, obviously, from the leaf, the, or from the name. The lotus, if you've ever noticed, water beads on top of and does not ever wet. So people have used scanning electron micrographs, as you can see on the left here, to scan the surface of a lotus leaf. And what they found is that when, if you look at a lotus leaf, it's just a series of nubs. Those nubs are what keep the water off of the surface of the leaf itself. So engineers have gone through and made this paint that you can put on the surface of buildings. Water will not adhere. It runs away immediately. So as opposed to a building getting wet and then accumulating all of the dirt and pollution and things that that exist in cities, on the surface of it, water dries, all the pollutants and solids stay on the surface, the building gets dirty. With lotus on as as a surface, it's clean always. It's a remarkable product. So in the second dichotomy here, this eco-inspiration or system-based products. Um, I am also an ecologist. This is something that's of great interest to me as an an ecologist because we want to try to mimic nature as much as possible or be inspired by nature as much as possible when we are trying to solve problems with an ecosystem. So uh, many of you may know the Cuyahoga River Uh, which is close to Cleveland, runs through the middle of Cleveland. This was a river that caught on fire in the 60s and burned for weeks because of pollutants, all petroleum-based products that were inside of it. It's since been cleaned up a lot, but this process can actually be expedited if we have wetlands created along the side of these rivers so that they could take out the, the, the products that are inside the water and the water can become clearer. You can actually create on a small, small scale, this is just a basket about this size, very small, maybe a foot across, that you can install anywhere, including on bulkheads. Can't get a more unnatural wetlands <laughs> than the surface of a bulkhead. But you can, you, can be, you can mimic nature. You can bring wetlands to where they don't normally occur. Right. So, those are two categories of products. Eco-inspiration products, bio-inspiration products. Another dichotomy that I want to talk through here is the pull versus push way to approach biomimicry, the actual creation of those two categories of products. In the, the pull approach, we have an idea. We have a problem that we want to try to solve. And we look to nature for species or ecosystems that have solved that problem in their own way. And we pull the idea from nature and bring it into addressing our problem. Right? I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And a contrast to that is the push approach, where we 
spend some time with an organism, we study their traits, we study their adaptations, we study their behavior, their morphology, their ecology, and we draw ideas from that. Right? So we kind of look to nature for the idea and then create the product based on that idea. Right? Most of what I'm going to be doing today is the push approach to biomimicry, but before that, let's talk about this poll problem. And this is an example of biomimicry that's, again, like the wetlands, of direct value and relevancy to conservation. So this is a, a, a massive problem where there are skyscrapers or any kind of glass buildings, or bird strikes. In New York City, where I moved here, I, I'm now at the San Diego Zoo, as we said at the beginning, I was, until last August, a professor at Columbia University in New York. And there are people whose job it is to go around the skyscrapers in midtown Manhattan, around the the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, various other notables, and pick up the birds in the morning that have died from hitting the skyscrapers overnight because they're lit and they're attractive and the birds don't know that the windows are, not, are, are solid. So this is a real problem for conservation. Millions of birds, possibly billions of birds, I've seen estimates up to 2 billion, die annually around the world from bird strikes. This is a huge problem. So if we say, okay, this is a problem. How can we solve this? What can we pull from nature to try to solve this problem? Birds don't tend to fly into spider webs. It's very uncommon that you see a large bird caught in a spider web or covered in them. Um, and part of the reason that we have learned why they avoid, why they are able to avoid spider webs, especially these kind of sheet webs, these orb webs, this is probably from Nephila, a common uh, garden spider that we get around here, is that they can actually see the spectrum of birds are shifted towards the, the UV, right? So they can see ultraviolet. And if you look at a spider web under UV light, it shows up as a barrier. It's visible under UV. So they can see UV. They don't so much see things that are shifted towards the red. So if instead we take you know, what we usually see, for example, these yellow flowers, these yellow composites, and analyze it under UV light, this is what birds see flowers as. Right? These reds are called nectar guides. And they're there to pull insects, the pollinators, towards the center of the, of the flower, which is where the stamens are, so they can get the, the pollen and bring it over to the stigma, the female parts of the plants, and make more, more plants. So if we can take that, that ability, literally superhuman ability, to see UV, and work that into glass, so that instead of it appearing clear, and therefore running into it, birds would instead see a network of lines akin to the spider web. And this is what this company called Ornolux has done. Um, this is the name of it. They've created this, this glass that has that network of UV uh, apparent film inside of it. So birds, when tested in, by the Max Planck Institute of, in Orn of Ornithology, uh, have noted that in the control glass versus the test glass, this is a net to keep the bird, that's what Vogel is in German, um, from running into the, the glasses, birds disproportionately go towards the control glass. Very rarely do they ever hit the side of the net close by the test glass. This is a massive success story, right? This is of direct value to conservation. So, that's a pull inspiration, or pull, pull approach to, to biomimicry. I want to talk about six, <laughs> six uh, species of insects and some suite of characteristics. I have three videos that I want to show you um, as we go through this that highlight this. Um, and maybe these could be used to inspire something for yourself, for some product. Right? Okay, first. Uh, in the Namib Desert, which is down in Namibia, Angola, and South Africa, on the southwest coast of, of Africa, uh, is one of the most driest places on the planet. They get, on average, maybe three inches of rain a year, right? Less than seven centimeters a year in the form of rainfall. But fog is a common event. Fog commonly comes off of the ocean, just like we have here in San Diego. You may have noticed that this morning. Uh, the marine layer, we call it, um, has uh, a, 
is an omnipresent force in the Namib. So the species that can live there take advantage of that fog. These are darkling beetles. And uh, you see these a lot in desert habitats. And they, it was thought that they had a series of hydrophobic areas, which are the tips or the ridge lines on the backs of their elytra. These are scanning electron micrographs of their elytra, which is the last part of beetles, the hard part. Um, their wing casings, the actual wings that they fly with are underneath these. So it was thought that there were these hydrophobic areas on the ridges or on the nubs, and then on the flat parts are hydrophobic. I'm sorry. These were hydrophilic on the high ends, hydrophobic on the flat ends, water accumulated on the tips or the ridges, and then they ran down towards the mouth. Well, as it turns out, that the, the behavior of the beetle is equally as important as the morphology. So they'll stand with sort of doing a headstand and make it possible for the water to accumulate on their, on their elytra, the wing coverings, and then roll down towards their mouth. And we'll see if this video works. This is from the BBC. So it's suitably stately. Where else but the Namib <laughs> would an ingenious little beetle stagger up the highest dunes on cold mornings, put its back to the breeze, and then stand on its head to collect a life-giving drink. Just drank it in there. Water accumulating on the back and the elytra on the legs, running down towards the mouth parts. And they accumulate on the top of these ridges of the sand dunes. It's a way to harvest water from the air that would not otherwise be available for these beetles. It's a fascinating combination of morphology and behavior. All right, second example. These are some of my favorite ants. These are in the subfamily Dacetiny. All ants are actually in the same family uh, called Formicity. Um, and this is one subfamily of them that has this special map mechanism called trap jaw morphology. And the jaws are structured such that they're one of the only ants they can open their mouth parts all the way, 180 degrees. And they open their mouth parts using mandibular adduction. It moves the, the, the muscles back, muscles move the mandibles back. And then there's a locking mechanism because this part in the structure here called a clipius comes down and keeps the mandibles locked in place, right? So you have a, a, a trigger structure set up here. So the mandibles, they, these, these ants feed on very quick-moving ants, or very quick-moving insects that are called springtails. Actually, one of the next few examples, I'll get to what they look like in a moment. But they can escape very quickly. And so they need to, these ants need to be very, very quick. And they have actually some of the fastest neuronal transmission rates that has ever been recorded. The way that they do this is that there are trigger hairs between the mandibles, it depends on the species. Different species do this in different ways. But those with this clipial barrier have trigger hairs between the mouth parts. So they walk around basically with a loaded gun, <laughs> essentially, and, or maybe loaded harvester blades. And they walk around, and when they, they encounter anything that is food-like, they snap shut. This video, this is from the Tree of Life web project from the University of Arizona. Uh, and the narration is a little cheesy, so I apologize in advance. But you can see the mandibles open to 180 degrees. The ants open their mandibles to 180 degrees Those and are the trigger hairs. Into position. When trigger this hairs time they're on the, the, the object, mandible itself. The mandibles are unlocked, releasing enormous energy and closing the mandibles with incredible speed. Wow, incredible. And it is incredible. <laughs> Right? So they have this, these trigger hairs that when, th this is an artificial thing because they were triggering the hairs themselves, the, the scientists under the microscope, with the antenna of another ant. So they kind of playing with the ant a little bit, no food here. Um, and they slam it shut. You can see they slam it shut with such force that they vibrate. They all have this huge head structure with these, as you can see, these are the adductor muscles, right, on the back. This is a different species on the side here. So these are 
locked and loaded and ready to go. All right, our third. I've separated up these six examples into three categories. You may have noticed the first two were mostly morphology or structure. The next two will be be mostly behavior. And then the last two will be mostly ecology. It's It's a facile distinction that I'm making between these three categories, but there you go. All right, so this is the group of beetles, actually, that I did my dissertation on. Um, and they may all look like ants to you, <laughs> but they are not. These are, these are uh, beetles and ants that, that have been, um, uh, that, that live in Arizona into southern Mexico, or southwestern Mexico. So this is an ant, this is an ant, that's a beetle, that's a beetle, that's a beetle, that's an ant. This is a beetle on the back of an ant. This is another beetle on the back of another ant. This is a beetle here that's trying to displace this beetle so it can get on the back of that ant. Right? So obviously these, these organisms, oh, and I might point out there's two different species of beetles here as well that are dramatically different to my eye but probably look identical. This is one species. This is a, a separate uh, genus in the genus uh, Septobius, and this is in the genus Denardilla. So you have these, these two species of beetles that live as obligate guests with ants. Most scientists... I assume most of you all, especially boys, this is, I think, carried on the the Y chromosome, um, like to drop things into ant nests and watch them get killed and eaten, right? Ants are not the most receptive of hosts. And so these are two species of beetles that are obligate guests. You do not find these beetles outside of the nests of ants. So the question, I think, immediately becomes apparent. Well, how do they do this? How do they make this possible to get into this otherwise incredibly hostile nest? They do this using behavior. And the nest is of value because they live in the desert. Water is very restrictive. Insects have, especially these beetles, actually, are almost never found in desert habitats because their cuticle is very thin. They'll dry out very quickly. So inside of an ant's nest, it's very warm, it's moist, they're obviously well protected as long as their hosts don't eat them. (laughs) They are really well done there. Um, So how do they get in? Well, they use behavior, and actually I did a whole series of introduction experiments where I introduced both of these two species into this ant nest and observed what the beetles did when they were introduced into a nest that was not their own versus what they did in the nest where they were from, where I collected them from, right? When I took the beetle out of the nest that they were from and reintroduced them back into an experimental subcolony of ants from that nest, the beetles just immediately got on the back and started doing the same set of behaviors. Got on the back of the ants, were grooming the ants, running their mouth parts through their, their running their legs through their mouth parts to, to groom. They're, they're gleaning food from the surface of the ants. They feed on some of the hydrocarbons that accumulate on the surface of these ants. But if I take those same ants, or those same beetles, rather, and introduce them into a different colony from which they were collected, they'll get attacked immediately. The the very few deaths were when I did this, when I introduced them into a nest that was not their own. But what they'll do is they hang out on the side. They hang out by the refuse piles where the ants have created on the sides and thrown, like, the food that they food parts that they can't actually ingest, left it there. The beetles will stand on the food, and they'll rub the food on themselves. They'll eat it. They'll smear it all over their antennae. Right? And it's not just the food. It's also, obviously, the, the substrate that the ants have deposited there, which are loaded with the cuticular hydrocarbons that ants use to differentiate from nest to nest. And they're all different from nest to nest based on that interaction of their genes the habitat in which they live, and the food that they feed on. It's a unique cocktail for every nest. Right? So you can use behavior to make your way into even the most uncomfortable of situations. So maybe trying to get into a, a club in lower Manhattan or something would be an example. <laughs> right. Okay, so this is the springtails that I was talking about a second ago with regard to those dacetine trap jaw ants. Right? The springtails are, are obviously correctly named. This is their spring here. This spring is, are the last two body segments that are specially modified and constricted and can bend all the way back. This uh, tip here goes down into a latch mechanism, and it's held in place. So normally when they're walking, this spring is locked. 
and it's loaded because instead of using muscular pressure, they use hydrostatic pressure. They flex their body, and they increase the pressure inside the surface of their body, which is essentially like a plastic tube, right, more or less. Cuticular tube, but nonetheless. Um, the moment that they are startled at all, they release that the spring, and the spring pl- throws them up in the air. And they can spring up about 100 times their body length. Like think about the high jumps that you could clear in the Olympics if you could do that, right? It's remarkable. So a different kind of locking and loading mechanism. And they do this locking and loading mechanism to escape from predators in different ways. I couldn't actually find a good video of them trying to get away from an organism in this way, but let's come back to our ants, the trap jaw ants, because they do the same kind of thing. But they use the explosively quick closing of their mandibles to spring away. The springtails, like these ants, have two different kinds of jumps. One is for a predator that they can get away from best by going straight up into the air. And another is for a predator that they can get away from fastest by jumping straight back. Right? So think of an aerial predator versus a terrestrial predator. And these ants do the same kind of thing. And here's a a short 14-second video that will show that. Researchers at Berkeley have noticed that in the bouncer defense, the jump is primarily horizontal, horizontal, while with the escape jump, the movement is primarily vertical. This is the same mechanism. It's just that in the bouncer mechanism, they're pushing down towards the ground and going back. And in the escape mechanism, they push straight down. So it's sort of forward to go back for the bouncer defense, and escape is straight down and up. Right? And they choose which of those two they want to be able to escape from, to use to get away from predators. Okay. Last two. Ecology. Antlions. Antlions are fabulous. You may not know what an antlion is, but all those little conical pits that you often see in very fine-grained sand like underneath the eaves of a, of a house or in uh, desert habitats underneath a rock. At the bottom of those pits, at the base of those pits, are these ferocious-looking little animals that you may even have a hard time seeing. This is the body. This is the head. This sickle-shaped, organi- sickle, sickle-shaped thing here is its mandible. Here's another one on the other side. And these mandibles are hollow, and they take advantage of their ecosystem to catch ants by preferentially throwing away particles of different sizes. If a particle is larger, they will throw it away at a lower angle. So they throw things away using their head. Right? They snap back their head very quickly, using their mandibles to propel things. And with the larger particles, they throw it back at a lower angle, so it's more likely to clear the pit. Because remember, they're at the base of the pit. So a lower angle has a greater ch- probability of escape from the, from the pit. If it's a finer grain and there's a disproportionate, uh, well, I guess, absence of the larger grain particles that are around them, they throw the particles higher up. Right? And so when ants come in and fall down into the pit... A finer grain surface, which has a, a, a greater um, angle of repose than the larger grained particles, if it's a, 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 a steeper angle, the ants will be more likely to fall down towards the ant lion, they spear them with their mandibles, and then actually for good measure they spear them and then they whack them side to side on the other side of the pit and knock them senseless. And then they suck the fluid out. They're vampires. They're not lions, they're vampires. Right? So they do that differently, and they'll do those, the, the angle of throwing differently based on the, the presence of large particles. All right, my last example. Um, waterproof rafts. Fire ants are not native to the United States. Solenopsis invicta is the species. They're from um, uh, South America, mostly from Brazil and Argentina. Um, they're Chitin, in general, the surface of ants, I've said chitin many times, is moderately hydrophobic, right? So ant or water won't tend to sink into the surface of the, the ants that much. But when you hook together a whole bunch of ants, this is, these are the ends of their feet, 
the green is one individual, the red is another individual. And they have these, this is like rock and roll, but for insects. And they have these tarsimeres that will hook together, right? And so different individuals will hook together and make these rafts. And they'll only do this when they're flooded. The place that these ants come from is in the Pantanal, in the southwest uh, of Brazil, which is periodically flooded. And these ants will form these rafts. That they'll pile on each other. They'll, of course, put the queen, which is the most important member of the colony because she's the only one that reproduces and makes more. She'll put that queen in the center of that raft. And they can float for weeks on end. It's remarkable. Again, just in response to, to ecological perturbations. All right. So biomimicry, why are we at the San Diego Zoo interested in this endeavor? Aside from it being a fun opportunity to tell a lot of cool stories, there's a lot of benefits to, of biomimicry to society. Well, it can lead to production efficiency and the reduction of waste, reduction of pollution in the form of, say, with that lotus sand paint. Right? If you don't have to use uh, caustics to clean the things off, clean the dirt off of the side of a building, that's a massive reduction in the amount of pollution that goes out and a reduction in the amount of costs to the company because it's clean all the time anyway. Why do you have to wash it? Right? Could possibly increase jobs, increase economic growth because it's a novel product, an unexploited uh, resource, a disruptive technology people often call biomimicry. Could lead to increases in profits, sustainability, and maybe even poverty alleviation depending on how it's done. So as I said at the beginning, conservation is, some conservation organizations, us in particular, are very interested in biomimicry because it is a resource. It's a repository of so much information. Over 1.2 million named species, over 12 million species in total on the planet, everyone has many stories to tell. And this is a, a quote from one of my heroes, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson. He's a works with ants, of course. Uh, it says, destroying a rainforest and the species in it for economic gain is like burning a Renaissance painting to cook a meal. As engineers, we should be really keenly aware of this because every species has this unique suite of instructive characteristics. All right, so us, a little plug for us. Talk about how great we are because we are. Bit of a facetious joke, but I mean, San Diego Zoo is, a, is one of the, the large, is the largest zoo in the world in terms of membership, in terms of animal holdings, in terms of uh, influence on zoos worldwide. We're, we're a big organization, not just because we have two facilities, the, the downtown San Diego Zoo, which is very close to where we are here in Balboa Park, and the Safari Park, which is where my office at the Institute for Conservation Research is based out of, which is up in Escondido to the north. So we are very interested in this because we are very interested in thinking about whatever addresses conservation. San Diego Zoo is a conservation organization that is our mission. And we have direct benefits that we can pull to conservation in the form of that Ornilux glass, for example, and also possibly the reduction in pollutants from using lotus sand, for example. We can also internalize the externalities. This is a phrase that this economist friend of mine likes to use, where we take things that we don't normally include as part of the calculations for the cost of things, like CO2 emissions or whatever, what have you, and work it into the cost of the product or of the process. Right? So if we think about the impact of glass on biodiversity, and there's some way to quantify that in a way that's reliable, we bring that into the calculation about what is a sustainable process. Another thing as a benefit for conservation is certification and tithing um, or investment directly in conservation. We should, as engineers, be concerned about the conservation of species that will be the inspiration for our products if we draw from nature. Right? And there's all sorts of solutions. Most problems that you all are facing, there's a solution for it in some species somewhere around the planet. So. As I said earlier, indirectly it's a, it's a benefit, and directly it's a benefit. And zoos in particular, which I was talking about at the beginning, we're coming full circle now, why we at the zoo are of value to you all. Most zoos have huge numbers of animal species. These are our numbers. We have lots of, of species. But all zoos, all nature areas, museums, aquaria, they're loaded with, with inspiration products in the form of different species. 
It's a major opportunity for you. We at the zoo have uh, become um, biomimicry stimulators locally here in San Diego. We've engaged in a series of different things. We have public receptions, talks. We do academic workshops. We do corporate workshops as well uh, with uh, corporations that bring us in to talk about how we can draw things from nature with organisms, actually, too, animal presentations, which we should be having here in a little bit. So what you can do, learn more about biomimicry. Think about how it can be involved in your thing. Support the conservation of the inspiration of the organisms that we're working on. All right. And with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. <laughs> ah, good. All right. And now we have Sonny, who's going to be coming up with our uh, non-human, our probably soul, at least that we're aware of, non-human visitor here at the conference. <laughs> Right. Okay. So I am just the humble human vector for our <laughs> non-human visitor here, who, of course, we can learn much from. So let me get her out. And thank you, James. So I am, my name is Sunny Robertson. I am one of the 150 plus educators <laughs> that we have at the San Diego Zoo. So I'm located down at the Balboa Park campus. And I'm bringing out one of our animal ambassadors. So essentially, we've got a, a group of animals that we use to take off grounds to meet folks like you, or we go to schools. Um, most of the time, that's where we're visiting. We also go to nursing homes and hospitals as well. We bring the zoo to folks who can't make it to the zoo themselves. <clears throat> so let me just get our friend out here. She's coming onto my glove, and because I have a, a giant leather glove on, it's probably giving you some idea of what she is. All right, so sometimes she tries to fly. I'm gonna get her tight here, and attempt, yep, there she goes. Oh, Sham. This is what she does when she sees a big open space, so <laughs> bear with me while Shaman restyles my hair for me. I'm going to get her back up on my glove there, get her feet comfortable. There we go. Yeah, she is, as you can see, fully flighted. So, and when she comes out into nice big rooms like this, she's like, ooh, I've, I've got to go hide in the darkest nook over there. But Sham is actually going to come up to the brightest spot in the room so you guys can all see her. And don't worry if you're feeling like, oh, no, poor Al. No, she's used to being in front of like 300 screaming school children who are like, yeah, it's an owl. So you guys are a very quiet audience <laughs> compared to what she is accustomed to. So we're going to work our way up here. And um, I was told they'll project her onto the screen so you can get an up-close view of her as well. Oh, and I should have brought some newspaper. I apologize to the conference people in advance. You might get a souvenir <laughs> on your floor. <laughs> so that, that is the one thing with a non-human visitor. Humans are usually a little bit better about not doing that. But OK, let me see if I can get her to turn around for you. Um, and do you guys know what species of owl I have brought for you today? Anyone familiar with her? Come on, I'm used to talking to kids who are more than willing to be like, ah! So feel free to, to talk to me. This is a great horned owl. And she, of course, is a native species. So they are found throughout North America, um, even ranging down into some parts of um, of Mexico, and um, they are typically found in places where there are trees, because you can see she's got this fabulous camouflage. But I want to talk to you a little bit about her adaptations, because I know I'm, I'm following James and, and his wonderful talk to you guys about biomimicry or bioinspiration. And so when I do presentations about this, um, we are actually starting to do outreach with uh, middle school kids right now and talking to them about bioinspiration. Um, one of the things we try to get them to focus on is what do you see? What do you see on this animal? What do you notice? You know, what are you curious about? What do you wonder um, that you can learn about her that might inspire you to have a grand idea for something that could maybe help people? So first off, I mean, because she is obviously um, an animal and comes from nature, we do notice that her features and her, her um, adaptations have multiple functions. So the feathers, as I pointed out, fabulous camouflage there. Look how pretty you are, Sean. And um, also, what else do feathers do for owls or, or birds in general? 
What do you guys think? I told you I'd be asking you questions. They might help her to fly. Good job. <laughs> yes, they help her to fly, of course. Um, unique to owls is the aspect of silent flight. They have serrations on the edges of their, of their primary feathers, their flight feathers, that allow flexibility and airflow through them so that you don't just hear the hitting of their wings against the air. It's much more useful for you when you're hunting at night when it's dark and it's more quiet. Uh, you gotta be extra sneaky. They also basically are wearing their birdie long underwear all the time as well. So she's got soft downy feathers underneath these brown ones that are keeping her warm. And also there is a, a measure of waterproof uh, ability with these feathers. They do repel water. So she's got a raincoat, she's got long underwear, she's got camouflage, she's got the ability of flight all in this one structure, which is just made of keratin. So pretty interesting that keratin, you know, this, that same protein, of course, that we have our hair and fingernails made of, can come in so many different forms. That is also what her talons, her nails are made of, and her beak. Sham, you're like purposefully not looking at them, I think. <laughs> they want to see your face. Okay, so there you go, you can see, <laughs> good girl. Sometimes she works with me. <laughs> so, and you can see that, that sharp beak right there too is also um, made of keratin. Now, you can see the shape of it, and, and if you guys have observed birds, you'll notice beak shapes are very unique to each individual species. It, of course, helps with whatever type of food they're eating. So what does shaman eat? Rats. Yes, thank you. Rats, mice. Um, she'll eat lizards, snakes. In fact, up to about 250 different kinds of prey. One of the only predators here of skunks, as well as North American porcupines. Skunk issue, not a problem. She doesn't have a sense of smell, which is not unique. I mean, most birds do not have a sense of smell, actually. But aren't we glad we have these guys around helping keep those skunk populations down? So what she does when she wants to capture, let's say, a skunk, she swoops down silently, grabs them in her talons, and here's the interesting thing. You might think, okay, so her muscles clench you know, the, her talons closed as she flaps away up into a tree to eat her food with that sharp, pointy, flesh-ripping beak. But the muscle contraction is not actually what's keeping her talons closed. She has a unique ratcheting mechanism with her tendons inside of her talons that essentially lock her feet closed once she's captured the prey which you could imagine helps to save her some caloric energy when she, if she doesn't have to be flexing a muscle the entire time where she's flying away to, to up in the tree to eat her food. Now, she can capture things about three times her body weight, but before that blows your mind, how much do you guys think she weighs? To best guess. 10 pounds? Anyone else? Five? I know, I'm like, I do work out, but, you know. <laughs> She, yes, yeah, she's about two and a half to three pounds, depending on how much she's eaten in the last day. Um, so she is very light for her size. So she's mostly kind of fluffy. Um, and her hollow skeleton. Essentially, that is what allows her to be so light, are those hollow bones. And so she can, you know, take things that are about nine to ten pounds um, in size as her prey, uh, which is, you know, if you've got a... You can hear a little bit of the silent flight there. All you could hear was the wind, not the actual flapping. Sean, no, you're just definitely not looking at them. Okay, well, there we go. I'll just, I'll turn. <laughs> so, um, I'm forgetting what I was saying now, Sean. You distracted me. So, are you going to pellet? You guys might get the full show. Basically, <laughs> what I was going to tell you about, too, is she might pellet for you which was, is very interesting. That's when they actually essentially bleh, bring up <laughs> the, the bones, the teeth, the hair, the nails, essentially all the undigestible parts of the food that they've recently eaten in the last couple of days, which makes sense, right? If you're not able to digest that stuff, why keep it in your digestive tract? Don't do it on me, please. <laughs> I know. And so um, her stomach is able to compartmentalize those items and then just digest the good stuff and bring up the rest of the stuff. Now I'll talk to you about the last um, thing because she may be starting to tell me she wants to go back into her nice dark crate. But um, the eyes, 
of an owl, right? We, I haven't even touched on that yet. She has enormous eyes for her body size. We always tell the kids, you know, make a fist. If you had eyeballs for your body size the same as an owl's, they would be this big. Uh, so she has very large eyes, but they also not only see very well because of the size of the eyes and the ability to let more light rays into that larger structure, but she has close to a million receptors packed in a square millimeter inside her eye. You have about 200,000. So quite a few more um, receptors there, all packed into a space probably smaller than your eyeball. So that's kind of an interesting uh, thing when it comes to optics or displays uh, for people to maybe explore more about. So they say if she was out during the daytime, she can see six times better than you and ten times better than you at night. Okay, she's seeming to calm down a little bit. I'll tell you also really quickly about her neck and that ability to move the head because that is essentially what everyone always wants to know. Can she turn her head in a 360? Now you guys are older than, you know, eight, so you probably know that she cannot do a complete 360. She would have to snap a few cervical vertebrae uh, to do that. But she does have the capacity of about 260 to 270 degrees. So we always make the kids try it. I'm like, look over your right shoulder. Keep turning your head until you can see your left shoulder. They all, of course, have to try it. None of them succeed. Uh, but it is because we only have seven Neck bones, she's got 14. And in between each bone, of course, is the joint that allows the motion. And her neck is essentially like a slinky with all of those bones and joints uh, squished so closely together. The reasoning for the neck, those large eyeballs would require rather large muscles to move had they any muscles attached to them. So she has fixed eyes. They are essentially the structure of a light bulb. They've got the bulb part that you see and a, a fixed portion into her head. So she does not have rolling eyeballs. That way, she, that way she has to move her whole head. So I always tell kids that shaman would be the worst at cheating on a test. She'd get caught every single time. So not that any of them do that, but. <laughs> All right, well, I um, am going to let her go back shortly here, but if anyone has any questions about her or there is anything you wanna know, I could, I could take a couple of questions. Anything? Mm -hmm. She's panting, um, which is her way of saying she's starting to want to go back into her crate. So, yeah. All right. Well, I will let the animal speak, and I will listen. So I'm going to let her go on back. If you don't mind holding still just for a moment, because sometimes she tries to help me get her back into her crate by flying home. So, and I should tell you guys, by the way, the reason we have Shaman, she was a rescue, um, but she was picked up as a youngster, and um, she was probably, you know, just learning to fly, and her mom was watching out for her, but a well-meaning person thought they were rescuing a baby. Um, needless to say, she became their pet for a little bit, and then they realized, oh, that's not really a good pet. <laughs> so they turned her into a wildlife rehab place, but at that point, Shaman had already learned that people are not so scary, and they feed me. So she is not a great candidate for release. So we have had her for over 20 years now at the San Diego Zoo. Thanks so much, you guys. Thanks.